Hi everyone and welcome back to the Making Milestone podcast. I have been meaning to do this episode for quite some time because I think it's a very important topic, so I'm excited to finally be filming it, and thanks for everyone who bared with me in making this because I said on my pages a bunch of times that I was going to do it, and then it just took me several weeks or months after that to actually get around to it. So anyways... Today's episode is going to be about harm reduction in the horse world, and for those of you who are wondering what that is, it's essentially ways that we can better the lives of our horses or reduce harm in situations where we may not have full control to do the best case scenario. So the purpose of harm reduction is to empower people to have things that they can put into place to make their horse's life better without having them be super discouraged that it's not like the full best case scenario. Because when we're talking about welfare issues, there are things that we talk about, such as like stalling practices, where people may feel stuck because they won't be able to offer the perfect ideal for their horse. And what I do want people to consider in this discussion is that The idea of harm reduction still accepts the fact that there are certain things that aren't the most ideal way to care for horses or to train them, but the idea is that it's better to reduce harm where you can than to be so discouraged and stuck on something that you don't even try to make a difference and you go into like denial and cognitive dissonance and you don't accept that what you're doing is causing more harm than something else that you could potentially do instead. So... That's what we're going to talk about today, Uh, but before we get into it, I just, of course, need to shamelessly self-promote. So I have some sales going on in my store currently. We have clearance up to 80% off on apparel and different types of tack and equipment, and I also have a bunch of new summer wear that I've released, including summer riding leggings that are super, super comfy and just really nice for in the summer, and we've released them in four different colors. So if you're interested in supporting my work, a great way to do that is by shopping in my store. Most of our apparel products products are made from recycled fabrics and we just have all sorts of fun things. We also just released a pride base layer that has a rainbow collar and rainbow embroidery. It's super cute. You can check that out on my website shopmilestoneeq.com, shopmilestoneeq.com. And I'm really excited about the stuff that we've released, so I hope you will be too. And even if you're not interested in buying, it's always appreciated if you just like share the web links or sp- help spread the word because I'm still a small little fledgling business and everything helps. I always get so excited when we get orders in, so thank you for that. Another way to support me is by subscribing to my Patreon channel. If you're looking for training help, this is probably one of the best and cheapest ways to access my training help, and you can do that at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash S-D. E-Q-U-U-S, S-D Equus, my Instagram name um, and TikTok name. So you can check that out there. You can subscribe for really low prices, but if you do $7.50 a month and above, you access all the tutorials that I've already put on there and all of the new ones that will be coming out. I also do Q&As for Patreon subscribers where they can ask me all sorts of questions, then we go through and we answer them um, and post the video after. Sometimes they're live, sometimes they're pre-filmed, but I give people lots of time to send in as many questions as they would like, and they can be questions specifically pertaining to your horse or just generalized questions, and that's a really great way to support my work because on stuff like the podcast, I don't really make any money off of it so it's just free time spent but I think it's an important thing to do and I also think that it's a really good way for me to express my thoughts in a way that I can't exactly do on so many other platforms due to the post limits or just the way that they're set up not being as ideal to have these long discussions so I'm really thankful for all of the people that support this podcast and like share my podcast and enjoy these episodes so thank you for all that if you're not interested in like doing any monetary support by way of the shop or the patreon page just sharing liking and commenting on my posts and following my pages is really helpful spreading the word and spreading the amount of eyes that are on my post is super super important and it really helps me continue to build my following and spread the word that i am trying to spread i also on my website if you go to my main website milestone equestrian.ca. I also have webinars, free resources, and as well as paid resources like paid webinars on all different types of topics such as how to use positive reinforcement training, recognizing stress and pain behaviors in horses, among other things. And we'll have more webinars coming up soon, so you can either watch them live or you can just watch the recordings after. And Yeah, super exciting and lots of stuff in the works. So all of that helps. For those of you who don't know, I got invited to Paris, France to speak at an equine welfare conference in September. That's a huge undertaking for me to 
like secure care for all of my horses and travel that far. I've never left North America and I am afraid of planes. So it's going to be interesting. Uh, but I am currently fundraising for that as well. There are currently raffles that are going on in my store that you can buy tickets to to win a, f a pair of hoof boots or a Cavallo um, saddle pad, Western or English, whatever your choice. And the prizes are worth up to $289. And you can buy tickets for the low, low price. I think it starts at $3.50 Canadian, which is like $2 American. So you can check those out as well. And it's much appreciated. And there's also other ways to donate, like just going to my PayPal, paypal.me slash milestone equestrian and doing a one-time donation. Or I'm also offering ad spots on my websites and shared, uh, um, Oh, sorry. Also, shout outs on my Instagram page or my Facebook page or, uh, as I stated, a spot on my website. And I could also do YouTube shout outs, too, if that was of interest to people. Uh, and they're by donation. If you're interested, you can contact me and I'll send you the minimum donation for whatever you are interested in. So thank you again, everyone, for all your support. I'm really excited about the opportunity to speak at this welfare conference in Paris. And it's going to be pretty huge. So I'm like, I'm super excited because it'll allow me to connect with other like-minded individuals in the equine sciences field as well, which will be super exciting. And this topic of harm reduction, I think, is really timely because of that. So let's just jump right into it and just start talking about harm reduction and horsemanship. So thank you, everyone. So as I stated, harm reduction is basically the idea of ways that we can better the lives of horses in situations where we may, we may be limited to completely change the situation. So, so, so some examples of where we may be limited would be like if you're a lesson student, if you lease a horse, if you're a stable hand who is working at a barn, even if you're a horse owner, but you're limited by boarding facilities in your area, or if you're a minor and your parents are ultimately the people who have the final say for your horse and all sorts of other things. So just situations where you cannot provide them the perfect ideal. Like for example, your horse might be stabled for 12 plus hours a day. And while you can recognize the fact that being in a stall for that long isn't ideal, you still want to try to better it the life the life of your horse in ways that are attainable and reachable by you. So that would be one good example. Another one would be if you are riding a lease horse and the rider or the owner has you riding in certain types of equipment that you don't necessarily agree with and that you know can be used harmfully and that can cause discomfort and pain, but you ultimately cannot change that type of equipment without explicit permission from the owner or if your trainer has you riding lesson horses and equipment that you don't agree with or is asking you to do certain things in the name of training and riding that you aren't necessarily comfortable with so those are just a few examples so when we're practicing harm reduction, the idea is first to recognize where we may be causing harm to our horses. And this is the most important thing, in my opinion, to recognize because a lot of people don't want to do this because if they cannot change the horse's situation in the way that is most ideal, they get discouraged and then they just double down on defending that what they're doing isn't harmful in any way because that's the easier, more comfortable thing to accept. So the first thing is to accept like where the care is lacking or where the training is lacking or where something isn't ideal or is more harmful than it needs to be and recognizing that and being honest with yourself. And I think something that is important to mention is that you can recognize where there are shortcomings to your care and your riding and training without being a bad person. You're not always in full control of the situation that you're in. And sometimes even if you can recognize what changes would be most ideal to make, there's going to be a time period that it takes to get to the perfect ideal. Uh, so there are lots of limitations and accepting where your care could be better doesn't mean that you're a bad person. And honestly, it allows you to be a better horse caretaker if you recognize where there's shortcomings in care and training and where there's potential for harm. Because then at the bare minimum, you can soften what you're doing or you can add enrichment and management type situations and so on and so forth. So I'm going to give a few examples of harm reduction that I've had to practice as someone that has worked in the industry as a professional because I would say that when you're employed by people and you're working with horses that are not yours, that's one of the most limiting situations you can be in because ultimately like you have to use whatever equipment the owner 
is providing or like the trainer that you're working for is providing or that the barn wants you to use in most cases, because if you don't, then you risk losing your job. And until you're in a position where your word may be taken seriously, you can't always make suggestions without causing huge rifts in the situation that you're in. So when I was working at the racetrack, this is probably one of the best examples when I saw lots of things that I wasn't super comfortable with welfare wise and that I knew were not the perfect situation for the horse. And what I had to do in that situation is just do whatever I could in my position to try to make those horses' lives better. So, for example, at the racetrack in town, there really isn't any turnout for the horses, and they're stalled essentially 24-7 outside of training and some hand walking. So it's really limiting, and it definitively impacts their behavior and makes them more likely to be reactive and dangerous to handle. So on top of that, people are more likely to use highly aversive training equipment such as lip chains or nose chains and also justify harsher forms of training like seesawing the mouth that the horse is taking off on you or using a harsher bit such as an elevator bit. A lot of people do still gallop in regular ring bits, um, but that that's definitely something that is a thing at the racetrack where you might need to bit up if a horse is super strong or even if you're in a snaffle where you're hauling off on their mouth more than you would like to for your own safety because the horse is trying to bolt on you. Um, so in that situation, like I had to handle horses with chain, nose chains and lip chains even when I knew it caused them pain and it wasn't the most ideal circumstance because I could rectify the problem behaviors that necessitated use of that chain simply just by turning them out more or changing the management situation. Like I knew that that was the most easy fix and then they would no longer need these harsher pieces of equipment. But since I was handling other people's horses and I was ultimately at the mercy of the trainer, sorry, my dog is barking in the background. I don't know if that's going to be caught on the recording, but since I was ultimately at the mercy of whatever the trainer and owners wanted me to use, I just had to go with it. And also in certain situations, like even if I could have made the choice to not use a lip or a nose chain, if the horse was really dangerous to handle, it could potentially endanger myself, especially since there wasn't necessarily anything I could do to prevent that level of reactivity when they're leaving the stall. Uh, Because even if you do use rewards-based methods in that situation, it's not necessarily going to bring them down enough when they need to expend that much extra energy and they're that wired and stressed. They also may not take food in that situation. So... I did have to use nose chains and lip chains, but my realization of how they worked and how aversive they were allowed me to use them more tactfully and softly. Like for example, I would try to lead a horse with two lead ropes and I'd have one lead rope directly on the halter off of the chain, especially in the case of a lip chain, and then one where the lip chain was. And if in any case I could get them to have less, like for example, instead of a lip chain using a nose chain, I would really try to work on that. And I would try over time to reduce the horse's level of anxiety and stress when I was handling them so that I could use less. But at the bare minimum, like I was aware of how aversive it was. So I was less likely to shank them with like a lip chain on like some people do when the horse is being really, really wired or really get after them with a nose chain. And I was much more likely to try to soothe them by talking to them, stroking their neck and preemptively just trying to settle them so that I didn't need to use use more force. And in that scenario, that's harm reduction, even though that what I'm doing is still technically harmful to the horse, it's reducing the level of harm that I am causing simply just by being one more understanding of why the horse is behaving in the way that they are, so that I'm less likely to get frustrated and react with frustration and anger. And two, recognizing how the equipment that I'm using actually works, so that I'm not going to delude myself into thinking that it's more benign than it is. Because a lot of people who do not accept how chains work are more likely to use them harshly because they'll just go, oh, they're fine. It's not that bad. Like, and they don't, they're, they're not fully accepting why these things are so much more potent in changing the horse's behavioral response than just ride, like leading in a regular, like flat halter is. So that's a way that you can reduce harm even when you know that the equipment that you're using is going to be painful for the horse. Also, in any situation where you realize that the horse may not actually need it, then that's when you can start to advocate for the horse and really work with them to try to change their behavior long term. Um, simply just by like a lot of horses, when you start to relax and you're not as up in their business and punishing, they will naturally start to relax. And when they're really used to being punished all the time for their reactions, they start to get keyed up 
before they're even fully reacting because the idea of like stress potentially leading to punishment because their stress causes a reaction which is then punished it can cause them to go over threshold quicker so if you stop being as quick to react with punishment and you instead try to redirect that behavior to something else and give them healthier outlets for that anxiety then you can help avoid larger behavioral responses in doing so Another thing that can be done, for example, with stalled horses is adding enrichment. So obviously a horse standing in a stall for most of their daily time budget is not ideal. It still causes a lot of problems, but there's many cases in which we might not be able to really change that for them. So what we can do is we can get them different types of stall enrichment, like such as toys. There's like jolly balls. There's hay balls they can roll around on the ground. You can do hanging lick it toys like the Uncle Jimmy's hanging ball, or you can even just do things where you get like a milk jug and poke some holes in it and fill it with like some grain or hay pellets so that they can rattle it and then get a snack out of it. Also keeping hay in front of them all of the time is a really good way to try to address that. So for example, if you're a stable hand or you're not owning the horse, this is something that you might want to try to suggest and be like, hey, like, could we potentially put their hay in hay nets instead of feeding them on the ground? Because I noticed that they eat it quite quickly and then they're going without food for an extended period of time. And that's a way that you can try to advocate for horses and better their situation in a situation that is not at all ideal or similarly like even if they do get turnout if you recognize the fact that it's not enough turnout they don't really have enough space in their turnout paddock to run and play you could try turning them loose in an arena to let them stretch their legs if you're allowed to i know not all barns allow that um and give them a chance to run and burn off energy in a way that they cannot in the size of the paddock or you can take them for like hand walks where you let them choose the direction that they go you let them graze and pick away and forage at all sorts of different things along the way and it provides them with some enrichment allows them to explore the property a little bit more and is more entertaining similarly you can even do things like cutting different types of like horse edible tree branches and like hanging them in different areas of their stall or paddock and getting different types of forage and like horse friendly herbs make sure that they're healthy and safe for horses to eat but you can set up different types of sit like stations so that they can practice more regular foraging and grazing behaviors that they otherwise might not be able to practice if they're out on like a dry lot or in a fairly small area and setting them up in different areas of the paddock also makes it more likely that they're going to move around and try to like taste these different things and it'll engage their brain a little bit more another thing is that if the horse has no option to socialize because of like being in an individual paddock a way that you could try to look at rectifying this is one if the paddocks have shared fence lines of any sort try to set it up so that there's at least like one area of the fence line where they could like reach over and mutual groom if they want to if that's an option or if the stalls could be taken down to half walls and you're allowed to do this you could try to do half wall stalls or bars in the stalls or make them like a little window and do stuff like that or if you have friends that are okay with like introducing your horses to each other you could take them out for hand walks together and safely start to introduce them over a fence line in protective contact and see if they'll get some level of socialization from that horses who are poorly socialized are more likely to react aggressively to one another or have more extreme reactions so it might take some time to get them used to each other and also not all horses are necessarily going to be each other's cup of tea because like people they have a preference with who they might want to interact with but it's worth a try and it's better than absolutely no ability to socialize at all and it gives them a little bit of an outlet for the need to socialize if you try to make situations like that so another thing is that under saddle we might experience situations where we need to engage in harm reduction so for example if you have a horse who you know is not getting enough turnout and can be frisky and excitable under saddle because of that and your trainer wants you to use a harsher bit because of that in the meantime until you're able to bit down just be really mindful of like researching how the bit that you are using works. And if there's a better alternative that you can still safely ride in, do that. And also consider doing groundwork before your rides to really try to work on the horse's state of mind and help them learn how to settle in the arena to make it more comfortable. Because remember, if you're using highly aversive training equipment that causes them discomfort, it's going to create a situation where they enter that arena and they're going to start expecting some level of discomfort and that can get their anxiety level up as well so sometimes 
doing the whole less is more thing where you take them right back to easier things and really focus on trying to reduce that level of stress before riding can really help. And then you may not need as harsh of equipment. Similarly, rather than just lunging your horse and letting them blow off steam by running laps around you, you could look at ways to engage their brain and try to help them self-soothe and settle that aren't just about burning off the energy itself. Because as they do that, they're going to be getting fitter and fitter and fitter. And you're probably going to need to lunge them for longer and longer and longer. So trying to look at it from a brain aspect rather than a physical aspect is important because while they outwardly choose to expend energy as a way of dealing with this pent up energy, stress and anxiety, it is an internal response that is like their brain. It's due to a lack of stimulation and then being taken somewhere where they know they can be physically stimulated. So for example, doing like obstacle work, setting up like little poles that they can go around, doing little circles around barrels, lots of change of direction and making it super fun and rewarding for them. It'll make them more likely to take themselves out of gear and use their brain to focus on you. So while they're not being as physically active, you can start to teach them things that get them to engage their brain, focus on you and start to expend mental energy that that way rather than only having it be physical because if their entire outlet is physical energy then you have a higher likelihood that that's what they're going to choose under saddle and it's not necessarily going to be in a way that you as a rider are going to like and enjoy so giving them like little tasks to do and like for example target training them in a situation where they're most likely to be calm so like their stall or paddock teaching it there so they're most able to focus and then trying to utilize that learned behavior in a higher stress environment as a means of distracting them can be really really useful and also doing things like if you know your horse is more likely to be nervous in a certain situation consider pairing up with a friend and bringing an, another horse with them so that they have a moral support buddy to help reduce the anxiety right there and then rather than fighting with them and having lots of reactions first. There's little things that we can do to try to lessen our horse's amount of discomfort and stress to and also make it safer for ourselves in the process because horses are the most dangerous when they are afraid and nervous. Like they really rely on the feeling of safety from herd members and we can kind of try to model and emulate that if we make them feel really safe around us but we have to build a history of that and it still doesn't completely replace the level of support that they get from other horses and also in order to be their safe place we have to help them learn how to self-regulate which means not just forcing them into really really high stress situations that make things difficult for them so wherever possible if you do have the option to starting to introduce rewards based training and try to make it fun and enjoyable for the horse is also a means of harm reduction even if you can't use it in every single setting because it gives the horse incentive to want to do what they're being asked and gives them incentive to want to participate and it gives them something in return so it's enjoyable and it is likely to improve welfare even if you can't use it in every single circumstance um and it can be highly discouraging when we can't fully do what we may want to do to improve the lives of our horses. But the nice thing about like harm reduction is you'll likely start to see differences in their behavior that will tell you that you're on the right track. And that can be really, really rewarding, especially for situations where you have horses that you really, really like, but that you may not own and that ultimately you're at the mercy of whatever their owners want. So there's lots of ways that we can try to reduce the harm that we cause horses and try to improve the lives of horses that we have less control over. And it kind of starts with like doing, trying to enrich their lives and also trying to provide an outlet for anxiety that causes unwanted behavior rather than fixating on the behavior itself and just trying to put a band-aid over top of that for example um also we can try to advocate for horses even if they're not ours if the person that owns them is likely to be receptive if you think it'll cause a huge fight and potentially put your job or your spot in a barn in jeopardy then it might not be worth doing um but if you think that there's a chance that they could be receptive, you could try to start advocating for certain changes that you think would be helpful to the horse. And if they're willing to let you start trying it, um, that there, there's the chance then that they'll see that it's working and then be super interested in continuing to do that. So it's definitely worth a shot, even if it initially gets a no, because there is a chance that down the road, they might be okay with you trying new things if it will improve their horse's behavior. And then as soon as people start seeing that improvement, if they do give you the chance, they're far more likely 
to allow you to do so. So for example, this is where you could kind of step in and be like, hey, like I've been reading up on like this, that, or the other thing. And I think that if I, like I, I would really love the opportunity to try a softer bit on so-and-so if you're leasing a horse and be like, would you be okay with me doing that? And if it doesn't work, I'm totally okay to go back to whatever you think is best. And if they'll give you that opportunity Set yourself up for success by doing groundwork and things to help de-stress the horse beforehand. And also start off really small. Like you don't need to be going like walk, trot, canter and over fences the first ride when you're doing stuff like this. It can be really, really small things initially and just doing like walk and trot with lots of transitions or in a, on a circle or in a round pen to help create more safety and a greater likelihood that the horse is going to behave in a way that'll make it most likely to achieve success. Um, and then if you can prove that it actually works and that it reduces unwanted behavior for the horse or at least doesn't make it worse, then you're in a position where they're more likely to, one, take future advice from you and two, allow you to keep doing things this way and then therefore you have reduced the horse's harm in that situation. Um, Another way you can advocate for horses is simply just by trying to help other people understand their behavior. So if you have your horse in a boarding facility, for example, you could give people instructions on how to handle certain issues that the horse may have and try to explain to them why it's happening. Now, not everyone's going to listen to you if this is the case. Not everyone's going to listen to you. But even if you can get one person on staff to listen to you and consider what you're saying, it might make your horse's life a little bit easier. And it'll also provide them with solutions to problems that are likely to work especially if what you suggest actually does definitively help your horse's behavior. Once they do it, they're going to see it works and then you might soften the way that other people handle your horses. So how we advocate for horses and what we suggest to other people who might be handling our horses or the horses we work with can help reduce their harm if that advice is taken and if it works. But for a lot of people, they do need to see proof that it works initially. So oftentimes that involves you being the first one to start doing it and show people like, hey, this is actually a viable solution for this horse's problem and having them see that and then go, okay, I'm going to give this a try and see how it works. Another thing to consider is that if you have a horse that, for example, refuses fences or is really spooky and bulky, rather than like p kicking on or like whipping them and punishing them for that behavior and making them go, you can start to do more groundwork in those situations and start to reward their curiosity and encourage them to go forward by making it highly rewarding and giving them something that they seek for doing this thing that scares them rather than making it really high pressure and high force because that will just create a learned history where when they see things that they're afraid of they anticipate being forced to go up to it and having that anxiety level increased by their rider or handler so if you start to kind of take that away and empower them in choosing to go look at things and make it really rewarding then you create a situation where they are more likely to go and approach these things and it'll make your life easier as their rider or handler as well as other people and it's totally worth doing because while it does take some time and while groundwork might be more boring for some people than riding you get a lasting difference and you don't end up having to fight with your horse as much as you do when you do the whole approach where it's like kick on and make them do it don't let them look at the thing that they're afraid of and just force them to go past it because they're not really learning anything in that way other than the fact that they have no choice in the matter and that regardless of their level of fear they're going to be forced to do something anyways so if you take that away and teach them like a process of how to handle what they're afraid of and make it worthwhile for them to engage in, then you can help reduce that behavior or completely eliminate it and it'll make things way easier in the future. So it's totally worth it. Like it's totally worthwhile. And it's just another way of practicing harm reduction to do that, even if you cannot do it in every single situation. So in my opinion, a lot of harm reduction is even if you can't change the living situation or the equipment used, simply just understanding the reason behind the horse's behavior so that you're not likely to label it as disrespect or just bad behavior or the horse just trying to do something to deliberately wrong you. And instead, you're looking at it as the horse struggling in a certain situation. As soon as you start to reframe your thinking that way, it becomes a lot easier to empathize with the horse and be less reactive as a rider and handler. Another thing to consider too is that when we're in the process of altering the way that we handle and train horses and we're going from having done things in a highly traditional way where we might be more likely to resort to high pressure and punishment to trying to do things more softly and with more rewards-based methods, 
there is a learning curve. Like even when you can make the decisions in the case that it's your own horse, there's a learning curve for undoing what your previous response to things would have been. So for example, if you've only ever been taught to punish unwanted behavior, it is really normal to kind of defer to that as your immediate response because it's what you've had conditioned as your response. So it does take some time to uncondition that response. And you need to be gentle with yourself in the sense that like if you respond poorly to a situation, but realize it after and catch yourself, that's a sign of improvement. Because in the past, before you started to look at things differently, you likely didn't even see it as a problem when you responded that way, which means that you were more likely to escalate and also more likely to repeat the behavior. If you just start noticing your behavioral response, or even before you respond behavior, Really, your emotional response to something and just noticing it and why it's there and helping yourself self-regulate and also helping yourself to learn a different conditioned response to unwanted behaviors, then what you're doing is you're teaching yourself skills that help reduce the harm to horses as well. And it takes time because what people don't necessarily talk about enough, I don't think, in the like in the journey of like self improvement and trying to alter the way that you handle horses, is the fact that when you've done something for a long time the same way, it is a conditioned behavior that is hard to fix and it just takes some time to fix. Like I don't think that anyone who goes from doing highly traditional training to rewards based training got there by doing a complete 180 pivot and just one day deciding like I'm not doing this anymore I'm never doing this again this is fine and just completely committing to positive reinforcement I don't think anyone does that it is so difficult to do and if anyone has there are going to be a minority in that sense because most people cannot do that. They cannot just do a 180 pivot and completely be able to apply something properly and never deviate back to old habits. It's really easy to go back to old habits because it's what you know and it's what you've always done and it's what will likely feel most comfortable in those situations because of that. And it's really hard to catch yourself and start undoing them. So it does take practice and it's just something you have to commit to practicing over and over and over again. And it's also not super helpful to beat yourself up and feel really, really guilty and sh ashamed of it because noticing and not feeling okay with something that you used to freely do and probably used to justify is the very first step. Noticing it and not being comfortable with that being your continued response is the first step of making change in how you do things. And the more you notice it, the sooner you'll start to notice it and the more likely you are to be able to have that pause moment where you stop yourself and you choose a different way of doing things. And the more you're able to do that, the more you are conditioning that new response to things and helping yourself regulate um, so that you don't continue to make the same mistakes. And it takes time. It takes practice. We can look at horses oftentimes and recognize the fact that if a horse has had a learned behavior where they've been made to do something again and again and again, that it takes them time to learn how to do it a new way, that there needs to be repetition with that new skill. But we oftentimes don't give ourselves that same understanding. What I do think is that accountability is important. So if you lose your patience with a horse and react in a very frustrated way and are highly punishing and you don't handle it well, Owning the fact that you handled it poorly and that it was a bad response is important, but you don't need to stay in that headspace forever and be like, I'm such a terrible person. I'm the worst. My horse is going to hate me. Instead, you need to be like, how can I rectify this in the long run? How can I regain my horse's trust after I have wronged them? What is the next step? And that's the way that you should look at it rather than staying in that moment and just beating yourself up because... The thing in the horse world that I think more people need to understand is that a lot of these ways of reacting to unwanted behaviors are so ingrained and so normalized that despite the fact that they are wrong, it's really easy to fall back into them because you've had so many people condition you to do that over the years and so many people enable you in doing that. So undoing that takes time. And it's not necessarily the easiest thing. And while it is wrong and there's a lot of training methods that people use that are harmful and damaging to horses, both physically, mentally, or yeah, physically, mentally, and emotionally, um, it's so normalized that much of the industry still agrees with it, which makes it so insidious and so hard to undo because it makes it very, very difficult to actually see what the right way is because there's going to be a lot of people that will convince you to do things the wrong way. So as soon as you start to see that it's wrong, 
that is your first step to becoming a better horse person and a more empathetic horse person and starting to do things the right way. But that first step is oftentimes the hardest because that's where you're going to be, need to be the most honest with yourself and you're going to need to catch yourself when you're doing things and notice like what often leads you to choosing the wrong things, what often leads you to choosing punishment in situations. Oftentimes it's situations where we feel scared, unsafe, or unsure of what to do next. So then we resort to punishment because that was something that we've been taught to do when we have unwanted behaviors. And undoing that response is difficult. So it starts off with noticing things. Also notice things within your horse. Before they engage in an unwanted behavior, what often happens? How do they get there? How stressed do they have to be to opt to do that behavior? What are ways you can help them self-regulate before they get to that point and offer a too big, too dangerous behavior? And how can you help them do it more regularly? practice and see what works. And a lot of it's just about noticing. Like this whole change and like harm reduction is noticing things and being curious about them. So if you're working with certain horses and they're doing behaviors that you don't fully understand, just notice them and then start to wonder what happened just before this. What triggers could have potentially stacked before they reacted this way? What purpose may this behavior that they're engaging in serve? So another way for like noticing harm reduction is, for example, if you have a horse who's stable a lot and they engage in stereotypic behaviors such as weaving, weaving or cribbing or oral stereotypic behaviors like playing with their tongue. Noticing that and the frequency of it and then noticing whether or not it decreases or increases with certain factors will help you start to solve it because if you offer the horse enrichment, for example, and you notice, hey, they're cribbing and weaving less. That means that the enrichment that you offered is working and fulfilling a need that the weaving or cribbing or whatever the vice was used to fill. And it means that you're on the right track. So that's why it's so important to notice all these behaviors because it'll also give you clues as to if you've done things correctly to help solve those behaviors, to help the horse with their anxiety. And you'll become more attuned to the minor changes in the horse's behaviors to notice when they're having a better or worse day and then get curious about what factors cause that. On top of that, what it allows you to do is notice when the horse is not being themselves. So you can notice lameness and illness earlier potentially because you're just noticing more things rather than being inconvenienced by unwanted behaviors and responding with frustration and impatience, which is what so many people are trained to do and so many professional riders do. And all of this just starts with curiosity. And the same thing with like harm reduction when it comes to equipment. Starting to recognize what equipment has the most potential to cause harm is started by learning how it works. So for example, learning the mechanics of draw reins and different types of bits and learning how they are misused and abused and why they're not necessarily ideal. It'll help you understand them better and thereby reduce harm if you're ever in a situation where you have to use them for whatever reason. So for example, with draw reins, they're a pulley system that increases the pressure on the mouth and pulls the horse's nose down and in. Regardless of how you attach them, the angle that the draw rein will pull the horse's nose is down and in. This isn't ideal from a biomechanical perspective because when we want them to be correctly on the bit and on the vertical and using their neck and body properly, we want them to kind of be reaching for the bit, reaching forward. And the draw reins are doing the very opposite of that. So what they oftentimes teach is horses to go behind the vertical. And horses who do this, even when you take the draw reins off, they'll often hide from any type of contact on the reins. So if you purchase a horse like this, or if you ride a horse like this, even when you're not riding in draw reins, they might tuck behind the vertical and you might feel responsible for that because technically, yes, it's incorrect, but it's a learned response that you then have to undo. So for example, if you're forced to ride in draw reins, you can ride with them a lot looser and you can be mindful of where the horse's head and neck are and you can give them breaks rather than holding them in a certain position all the time where they might fatigue their muscles and they might start having to tuck behind the vertical and use their bodies in a far less correct way because they're so tired. And you can just be more conscious of that. Similarly, if you have a horse that has a tendency to go behind the vertical, rather than just going, oh, this is just what they do, they do it to themselves, you can recognize the fact that even if they're making the express choice to do that themselves, one, it is likely a learned behavior that a rider has taught them somewhere along the way. And two, even if it was completely by choice and something that they like doing, it is not ideal. It's not good or healthy for them. So their choice to do it really doesn't matter because the harm that it causes remains the same. 
So what you can do in this case is start working on exercises to encourage them to go in front of or on the vertical, like lifting up your hands if they tend to tuck and get really behind the vertical, um, using a target stick, even if you just do it from the ground or if you have a friend on the ground to encourage them to reach that nose forward. Of course, you'll have to target train them first in order to really use it within that context, but that's a really great way to show them exactly where you want them to be positionally. But the main thing is just being mindful of like when they go behind the vertical and ways you can ride them and ask them to use their body in order to avoid them holding that position for extended periods of time. And then you can prevent the harm that it causes by not having them do it all the time and also helping them unlearn that unhealthy habit. And this is something that you can do whether or not the horse is yours because you can just change how you ride and operate on them when you're working with them to help promote the correct way of doing things. Um, And it just starts with, again, noticing things because It's more ideal to have a horse a bit above the bit and like in front of the vertical poking their nose out than it is to have them behind the vertical. So in that stage, like when they're trying to learn how to carry their bodies correctly, it's actually more, um, it's like more preferable for them to kind of be a little higher headed and with their nose in front of the vertical, like provided they're not completely stargazing because if they're completely U shaped with their nose way up in the air, there's probably something going on pain wise, be it in their back or like dental pain or something because they're avoiding something to that extent. And that's also not a comfortable position for them to carry. So that's something you also want to look at, but them being a little high headed and not flexing at the pole a ton is a lot more preferable to them being over flexed at the pole and going behind the vertical. And it's often a stage between teaching them how to be more accepting of the bridle and how to start relaxing and stretching down. Uh, oftentimes as riders, we want to make things go faster. So we take all of these shortcuts to the detriment of our horse and sometimes taking it right back and just taking our time really, really helps. And just thinking of different ways to try to do things rather than resorting to common but more harmful tactics that a lot of people in the industry use. Um, Another thing to consider is that there's different ways you can reduce harm. Like, for example, if your trainer wants you to carry a whip or you feel like you have to wear a whip or spurs for whatever reason, be really mindful of how you use them. If you're going to hold a whip, it doesn't mean you need to spank your horse with it. If you're going to use a whip as an aversive training tool, try to consider going like really light repetitive taps like really gentle like not whacking them but like tap 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 that is still aversive but it is substantially less scary for the horse than whacking them really hard similarly when they're responding to fear maybe consider not doing that maybe consider just pausing and letting them look at something that they're afraid of and letting them take it in instead of just ushering them forward and making them march right up to it maybe just consider being with them in that moment and helping them self-soothe and self-regulate rather than using tools to kind of force them to work through that discomfort. And it doesn't necessarily need to be physical discomfort. It can be like an emotional state, like anxiety that's causing them discomfort. So these are just all these little things that you can do to improve their situation. Like another example is like at horse shows. If you take your horse to a horse show and you can tell that they're super, super nervous and they're struggling to deal with the environment, maybe start off by hand walking them and doing some groundwork and helping them self-regulate and making it really reinforcing. Offer them some grass or some food to help them self-regulate by chewing and keeping them busy. And try doing that for a long enough time that they start to let down before you get on them. Maybe you'll take them to a less busy warm-up ring if they're not handling the really busy one well. Maybe you'll scratch some classes or do a lower class or do an easier one for them if they're really, really struggling. And if they really have a big blow up at a show and they're not handling it well and they don't self-soothe really, then that's a sign that it's like, okay, maybe I have more stuff to work at before the next show. And maybe there's some things that I need to consider rather than just working the crap out of them physically and trying to exhaust them physically to change their behavioral response. Just notice how they're feeling and be like, okay, they're really struggling to deal in this moment. Like anytime horses get really elevated and they're like actively reacting, we just need to start to look at it like they're struggling with whatever this is. For whatever reason, they're having a struggle internally and they're outwardly showing that to me, be it due to stress, anxiety, or pain, they're having an internal struggle. And instead of viewing it as an inconvenience, view it as them showing to you like, hey, I am having a hard time. And then you handle that accordingly. And that difference in mindset will help you to do things better basically no matter what. Like if anyone gets anything out of this podcast, I want it to be that change in mindset. Rather than viewing horses behaviors or like resistance or disobedience or inability to do what we want as them being 
disrespectful or rude or naughty or otherwise just not wanting to do what we ask, view it as them having struggle for whatever reason. Like maybe they're anxious, maybe they're stressed, maybe they're in pain, maybe they simply don't understand what you're asking them to do or physically cannot do it and start to change your perspective in that way because horses choose the path of least resistance. As animals, they do not want conflict. They want conflict resolution. They don't want to be in a state of conflict. So if you're finding that your horse is frequently in a state of conflict, they're probably just as, if not substantially more frustrated, scared, and anxious than you are. And as their handler and their caretaker, it's your job to try to help them through that to the best of your ability. And that can take a lot of practice, but it honestly just starts with noticing these behaviors for what they are, rather than mislabeling them and taking the easy path that is inadvertently blaming the horse for their behavioral reaction. It's really common for people in the horse world to say it's never the horse's fault, the horse is never wrong, it's always the rider's fault, but in practice, that is seldom actually applied because anytime we are punishing the horse physically for something, we are blaming them because you cannot punish without saying that they have done something wrong and saying that it's wrong is blaming them. If it was never the horse's fault, we could not justify punishing them ever because we would view it as a shortcoming of ourselves. If they engage in the wrong behavior, it means that we've done something wrong. And that seldom ever happens. So starting to take accountability for what your actions mean versus what you say that they mean is really important because a lot of people will, for example, have a horse who is way softer in a harsh bit and they'll use that to be like, my horse loves this bit when really what they mean is my horse is more responsive in this bit and I can ride them easier. That is a much different thing than the horse loving and enjoying it because likely that response is due to the discomfort that that bit causes them. And that change in thinking will allow you to be more compassionate and empathetic for your horse and also allow you to be more honest with yourself. Like that taking accountability and ownership over what your actions mean and like what you're actually doing rather than taking the easy way out and describing it in nicer, more flowery ways is so, so important. Like for example, like when we say like, oh, we're just like encouraging him and motivating him like with the whip. No, you're using the whip to apply pressure to get him to go forward and it is an aversive pressure. It's not an encouragement or saying correction instead of punishment. Correction and punishment are the same thing. When we're correcting an unwanted behavior, we are punishing it because the correction serves the purpose of making that behavior occur less frequently. So smacking your horse in the nose, a lot of people might call a correction when they bite, but it's punishment. You're smacking them. You're hitting them. Be honest with yourself. And it's not even to say like, feel like a terrible, guilty person, but at least be honest. Don't try to water things down to be what they are not, because what that can lead to is you justifying worse and worse things. And some of the most abusive people that we see in this industry, how they have enabled doing such terrible instances of abuse where they're using high levels of really painful, stressful punishment, they got there by all of these other little steps of justifying smaller occurrences where they're being unfair to their horse until they're fully comfortable with engaging to some in something to that level of abuse. So starting to hold yourself accountable earlier and just being more honest with yourself about when you are making excuses and when you're trying to evade accountability or deny what your behavior is actually feeling like to your horse. It'll help you prevent from getting to the point where you justify things that are worse. And it'll also just help you be more empathetic and understanding. And honestly, it'll serve you better in the future because when you have a horse who trusts you more and who doesn't have to fear you smacking them or getting really angry at them for things, you'll avoid escalating their level of anxiety because of your behavioral response. And you'll likely see a really big positive difference in how they behave because of that. And for a lot of people, they have to see and feel that proof in order to actually believe it and fully commit. And the problem with that is that it makes it really difficult to get people to be willing to try these new ways of doing things because if they don't see a response right away within the first few minutes of a session or in the first very first session, they get impatient and then they escalate things to a point where they're more likely to frustrate or make the horse anxious. And that's one of the most common problems that I see in people who are starting to use reward-based methods. They're looking to see a response from the horse as quickly as they can get one when they're forcing them to do something. And I think an important takeaway when you start to change your methods is that when you're used to forcing horses to do things and they have no choice, and when you decide that when you want them to do something, they need to do it right then and there, 
you can't take that expectation into a program that is about allowing the horse to process things for longer and allowing them to choose to do it or trying to encourage them to choose to do it through rewarding them. Because inherently in that program, the horse has more autonomy. So you cannot expect to get the same type of reaction as fast as you can when you are forcing them to do it and they have no choice. And essentially you're just demanding. With that said, what I would say about rewards-based training is that when you're escalating a horse to a high level of fear and you're really getting loud with like your movements and really stressing them, oftentimes in those programs, horses will engage in a lot of escape behaviors and be really frantic and afraid for an extended period of time before actually engaging in the desired behavior. And a lot of times that takes longer than just doing things the soft way. But people are actively involved and more energetic in their responses in that situation. So they may feel like they're doing more, even if they're having to engage in way more calorie burning activity, um, way more dangerous activity, and they're actually taking longer. Like for example, trailer loading. A lot of people who trailer load by force actually take longer by far over time than people who who use rewards-based training, and they just create a consistent repetition showing the horse like, hey, the trailer is very scary and high stress because you're going to be forcibly put in there by someone who's making the outside so scary that you finally choose to get in. And over time, that usually takes longer, and it can also teach horses to be more and more difficult to trailer load and actually make it worse over time. And then you have a far bigger problem to try to fix at that point that will take way longer to fix the nice way because there's so much more trauma associated with it. So slow and steady is often the best way to go. And with harm reduction, you might not always be able to do it that way because you'll be limited by the rules of other barns or what owners and trainers want you to do or in management case by being a boarder. You might not be able to do the perfect situation. But what I would suggest to people is just try to do the best that you can in any situation. And if you can try to advocate for change and it's a realistic change, like for example, in a boarding barn, advocate for a change that you'd like in your horse's care, just try asking. It doesn't hurt to ask. Ask really politely and express why you want to do it. Like, for example, if your boarding facility refuses to fill hay nets and you want your horse to have a slow feed hay net, be like, I'll pre-fill a bunch of nets for the week. Is that okay? And if they say no, then be like, why? Why is that? Um, and see the reasoning for it. Because if you're taking the work away from them in that situation and doing it for them so they don't have to worry about getting staff to stuff a hay net for just your horse, in theory, it makes their life easier. So if they still say no to that, I would ask why so that you can find out why. Because if they can't really give you an answer, then they may just end up saying yes. Um, but... Yeah, so doing whatever you can and just kind of reframing your mindset. Like harm reduction starts with you and your perception of things. Because like I said, like when you've been trained to be really highly reactive and punishing and training and high pressure, it takes time to undo that. And the ability to undo it, especially on as short of a like a schedule as you want, as you're looking for, it starts with noticing your behavior and getting comfortable calling yourself out and being honest with yourself about things that you're doing instead of justifying them because the feeling of feeling bad about something that you've done is so uncomfortable. A lot of people try to run from that discomfort by justifying their actions in situations where they have reacted poorly. And what I want to make clear to everyone is that as a rider, um, be you a pleasure rider, a competitive rider, a rider who wants to be a professional in the future. Being able to own up to your mistakes, recognize them, and acknowledge them is actually a huge strength. For a professional, that's so huge because you teach your students that, one, there is no shame in making a mistake, that everyone makes mistakes, even someone that they regard as the best of the best, like even someone that they regard as an idol can admit to their mistakes. So it'll make them feel less ashamed when they're making mistakes. It'll make them more likely to own up to their mistakes because you're modeling that behavior. And another thing is that admitting to when you've made mistakes means that you're able to fix them easier because you're recognizing the fact that you should be doing things differently. And this allows you to grow and learn over time at a far greater rate than someone who who never wants to admit when they're wrong. We see a lot of trainers who have been in the industry for decades stagnate their personal growth due to their inability to admit when they're wrong. And what this results in is them being a less efficient trainer over time. And while their methods may work on horses repeatedly, they will likely have horses that they do not work with and they'll have shortcomings in 
training where they're limited or where they endanger themselves more than necessary or cause horses more stress than necessary because they've made the choice to stop growing. And over time, this is unfortunate because they could have become a better and better trainer if they were more comfortable admitting to those shortcomings and their mistakes. The biggest strength you can do, honestly, I think, in the horse world is owning up to when you're wrong and being able to look at where there's room for improvement in your training sessions. Because honestly, even if you have the best ride ever, odds are if you're looking at it objectively, there are things where when you're finished and you're looking at it in hindsight that you could uh, you could improve on. Um, and even if it's really great, you can recognize, wow, I did really well in the moment, but there's here's some things that I want to work on still. Um, and that's not a bad thing. It just means that you're perpetually learning and growing and completely involved in how you can do better as a rider. What I also want to say about admitting to mistakes is that it's a strength in terms of trying to handle criticism of other riders. As we all know, the equestrian world is highly, highly like critical. Um, and online, especially people are super critical of you. If you can admit to your mistakes and own up to when you're wrong, it becomes a lot easier to either listen to other people's criticism or just ignore it and not be bothered by it, not internalize it and have it impact your self-worth. On top of this, it makes you harder to criticize because you're not hiding your flaws. You can post videos and be like, yep, this is what I did wrong. This wasn't ideal. And then it takes the power out of the hands of people who would otherwise shame you for those things and try to hold it against you. Uh, it makes it easier for other people to learn too, because if you're criticizing yourself, they'll be more comfortable looking inward at themselves. And I think that's a really powerful thing. It's very empowering. And that's a lesson that I've honestly learned more recently because I used to be so, so defensive and I never wanted to admit what I didn't know. And when I was pretending that I knew the most, it was a time where I actually knew the least because my egotistical response to things impacted my ability to learn and grow because I didn't want to admit that when I was wrong. So when information made me uncomfortable and made me feel wrong, I was less likely to explore it and really look into it because it made me feel uncomfortable. And that impacted my ability to grow. When I started to be able to accept the fact that there were a lot of things that I didn't know and a lot of things that I had been taught incorrectly, it became a lot easier to learn and grow and it became more comfortable to read information that initially would have made me violently uncomfortable. Still, I encounter information that is hard for me to hear and that it makes me uncomfortable, but it I don't run from it to the same extent as I used to. And it's made me also learn how to like see what is and isn't credible information to a much greater degree. So it's been a huge, huge strength and I'm super thankful for that. So anyways, as a, like a recap and follow up, harm reduction starts with like your perception and just trying to give the horse the benefit of the doubt and be curious about the reason and motivation behind their behavior. If you start to look at every behavior they offer as communication and something that stems from some underlying motivation, you're more likely to get curious and try to get to the bottom of why that behavior occurs. And if you address that underlying motivation, the behavior will go away. So this is what people mean when they say that they don't use punishment in training. It's not that they just let their horses walk all over them. They look for the underlying motivation of the behavior and address that. And in cases where you cannot identify it, I mean, or where you cannot address that un underlying motivation, if you still identify it, it'll uh, at least allow you to at minimum be more compassionate and understanding of the horse rather than just being afraid and frustrated by their behavior and having that impact how you handle them. Because a lot of the most difficult horses get mistreated the most because people don't like them. They find their behavior frustrating and scary and then they go about handling the horse in a way where the horse can clearly feel that the person doesn't like them and they're angry with them. And that only serves to escalate things. Horses that are struggling the most and who have the most unwanted behaviors are usually the ones that need your help in understanding the most. And they're usually the hardest ones to give to that because they're so difficult. Um, but it's necessary, especially if we're in the pursuit of becoming better horse people. So I hope that was helpful. I would be super interested in people letting me know what they think of this podcast. And um, if you enjoyed it, if it resonated with you, please share it if it did. I really always appreciate people liking and sharing my podcasts. Um, and like, feel free to use like sound bites from this in stuff if you want to. Like, I appreciate that as well. Uh, if you credit the podcast when you do that, that would be really great. A lot of people still don't know that I have a podcast. Um, so it's just, it's always nice when people share and 
let me know how my episodes resonated with them. So that's always really appreciated. And just to reiterate, if anyone is interested in supporting me and my work, I'm going to link all the links that I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast in the description of this podcast. So if you're interested in um, helping support me in my endeavors and continued content creation and other stuff like the Paris trip, that's the way to do it. And it is so, so, so appreciated. I couldn't have gotten to where I am today without the help and support of people online. And I'm so grateful for it. Um, And I'm also really happy that in sharing my story that I have been able to help other people feel more empowered in changing things in their horse, in their horsemanship. And like, I think that's also why it's been so important to me to call myself out and to really be honest about my journey and share it because it's, it's been something where like, like I really struggled. So I basically in sharing what has happened to me and like how I've learned and grown as an equestrian, my hope is that I will help other people be more comfortable in doing so and help them deal with those anxieties and those weaknesses in less time than it took me to deal with mine. Because I really wish that I didn't waste so many years being as stubborn and like the way that I was. Um, but like it was part of my journey and my hope is that I can use like my journey as an equestrian to help other people make better decisions in the long run for theirs in less time because that I think that's ultimately also a means of harm reduction. If sharing my story helps other people change their perception on things and even if it only helped one horse, that's still reducing harm for one horse. And I think that's also like to finish on this, lastly, if you can only make a difference for one horse and like even on just one day, you made that one day better. You made their day better that one day. You made it less stressful, less scary, less difficult for them in that one day. You've made their life easier with your presence in those interactions. And rather than fixating on the fact that they still have other unpleasant interactions or like unpleasant aspects of their life, just consider what you can do in that moment when you are with them to lessen the amount of harm that comes to them and recognize the fact that because you're conscious of that and because you want to help them, you're making a difference in those, even even if short, in those moments. You're helping reduce harm for the horse in those moments to, at the bare minimum, make it a little bit more tolerable for that horse and make that horse feel a little bit more understood and liked and enjoyed and appreciated in those moments. And while it may be small, it is still making a difference in those moments for that horse. It's not about huge sweeping change all the time because sometimes it's the little moments that improve things. Because also within those moments, the things that you do to try to reduce harm, other people may witness and they may want to do the same. And then you've created what could be like a wildfire of change because you've gotten one person curious and then they can pass that on to the next person, to the next person. And then all of those people are also contributing to little moments to better the lives of horses that they are handling when they otherwise may not have done that. So a little moment, a tiny little bit of change and a little reprieve for these horses in these situations In the moment, it'll feel really, really small, but it could end up being a lot more than that. And these little moments also will add up to be more significant over time. So you're better off trying to reduce harm in those moments and doing whatever you can to make horses' lives better. Even if it's not completely fixing everything, you're still helping. You're still making a difference in those moments. Making horses happier and improving welfare industry-wide and making a difference for the horse is not always going to look like pulling a horse out of a slaughter pen, getting an emaciated horse out of a rescue situation and reviving them back to full health. Those are, of course, like really substantial, potent ways that people can see the changes being made. But little stuff matters too, because little stuff still makes a difference for horses. It's not about all these big sweeping acts. It can be little, little things. And I think that's something to take away from this is that if you can make a little bit of a difference, it's better than either contributing directly to the harm all the time and not caring or making no difference at all. A little bit of a difference is going to add to how much forward we progress because you're adding to change in the industry, even if it's just a little bit at a time. And eventually you might be offered an opportunity where you can offer bigger change, but it starts with little steps 
towards improving the lives of horses. So thank you for listening to this podcast. Uh, For those of you who enjoy the podcast, please share. I really appreciate it. And I'm so thankful for everyone who supports my work. And um, I hope that this resonated with people. So thank you and have a good day.